Well, hey, everybody. How you doing? Hey, that, uh, if you're not, uh, that scene, some of you would, would wonder, in fact, can I just start the sermon off by giving you some, some homework? Huh? Huh? Every teacher should never do that at all, but I'm going to do it. Uh, you, you, I think you'll like the homework, but that, the, the series called The Chosen, uh, it's, it's, they take scripture, but then they fill in some blanks, and, and so it's, it's, a good, it's a good way to get you into the life of Jesus and the disciples and what was playing out. So uh, if you, you, it's, it's on different subscriptions. You're good enough to find it. If you want it for free, uh, you can go to, they have an actual app that you can download on your, on your TV or your device and watch it. So there's your homework. That's, I don't think that's that bad of homework to, to watch that. But here's what we're going to do. Uh, you and I have a tendency to wrestle with our purpose in life where we just wonder uh, basic stuff about uh, what's God asking me to do? What should I be doing? We, th- we think of it typically. Uh, what's, what's our vocation? Where should I live? And all those big decisions, right? It's deeper than that. And I, we're going to spend a handful of weeks talking about this, about your purpose, my purpose, and what Scripture says about all of this. And so, so to do so, we're going to go after the life of Jesus. We're going to dig into stuff that he taught, that he did, and begin to understand that you actually were not uh, made on accident, that God, the almighty God, made you with a purpose. And you and I get to actually not walk through just wondering, oh, I don't know, I don't know. We can live this, this calling out. So I want to start with the first miracle that Jesus does. It's often misunderstood or not understood. We read it and we're like, neat. And we just keep moving on. And so I'm going to bring you into that. If you'd like to look it up, it's going to be in John chapter 2. That's where I'm going to be. But to, to help you be at where we're going to be at, uh, we got to go to a, a wedding reception. Okay? Now, I know this is wedding season. And some of you, you're, that's, that's your summer. You're like, what are you doing this summer? Going to weddings. That's what I'm doing over and over, right? So... This moment that Jesus does, it's, it's amazing, but there's some context behind it that well, I'm going to read it to you, okay? And then I'm going to describe it because there's so much context there that for you and I to understand what he does, we got to know a lot of things that were very normal at that time for us to walk this out. And it has everything to do, has everything to do with your purpose, okay? So you just have to trust me. That what I'm reading to you and what we're going to, you're like, David said it had to do with my purpose. I'm not seeing just... Trust me on this. So I'm going to read it to you. I'm not going to put it on the screen or anything like that on TV. I'm just going to read it to you. Are you ready for a story? This is true. This is a real moment. This is not even a parable. This is real. John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples when the wine ran out. I'll describe that later. Some of you were like... Oh, no, right? Uh, When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. I mean, logical so far. And Jesus said to her, woman. Now stop for a second. (laughs) In our culture, you don't speak to your mom that way. Like that's off limits, right? (laughs) Like... The other day, Bo, our four-year-old, looked at me and said, David. I was like, ah, mm-hmm. yes, that's my name. That's not my name that you use, right? So you got to know culture. He's actually, it, it, does, it gets lost in translation. He's being very respectful. I know in our context, we're like, okay. But, okay, so I just, I, sorry, not in my notes. You just need to know that. What does this have to do with me? He's asking. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I love how she, good mom. Yeah, that's neat. All right. So, and he just keeps, she keeps moving on like, okay. But here's, here's the miracle. Here's, here's, oh, just listen to this. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. Oh, I skipped, sorry. Verse six. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. The author is trying to help us understand what he's about to do. Then Jesus says to the servants, fill those jars, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim, helping you understand how much water he got put in there. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, although the servants who had drawn the water knew. Yeah, they did. Uh, The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. Um, 
I mean, the Bible said that. And you know why the good wine is served first and then you serve the not so good wine later because people are not tasting like they tasted at the beginning. It's in the Bible. I'm not condoning it. Just, just reading what the Bible says. Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, and then, and then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. So let me walk you through this, because what that just said was a ton of stuff that in that culture, in that moment, had so much meaning and has everything to do with what God wants to do in your life, through your life, your current right now, I am alive, so what does today mean? So we'll start off with just some basics. Uh, I read to you that there, uh, these jars were uh, 20 to 30 gallons times six. If you didn't love math, nor did, nor did I. Uh, that means about 120 gallons to 180 gallons of water in these jars that he turned. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of water. We're clear, but it's a lot of water. Uh, and turned 120 to 180 gallons of water into 120 to 180 gallons, gallons of wine. Not box wine, like really, 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 really good wine. According to the, the people who, who tasted it, right? The ones who was like all of a sudden going, this is fantastic. Like didn't just make it this epic. Now, if you ran out of wine and you were the family responsible with throwing the party for the wine, if you ran out, according to tradition, Jewish tradition, shame would fall upon your family. No joke. It would, these, these were not just parties. This was the display, in essence, of who your family was, what you were about, even the money that you had, and how big of a deal this was. And so they put everything they could into these parties. So if you ran out of wine, you need to know what the family is feeling, not like, oh, that's fine, everyone will just drink the water that we have. They're wrestling with, we will have shame fall upon us for, for the rest of our lives. That's how big of a deal. I know it seems extreme to us, but then it, it was weighty. And what's profound is if you begin to look at this, because it's kind of weird. As a kid, I remember, uh, you know, we'd go to church and, and they would say, okay, well, we're going to look at today Jesus' first miracle. And he turns water into wine. And we kind of just moved on because we're like, neat. Like, it didn't feel like it has, like, eternal significance. Like, he did almost like a, it feels like a party favor. Like, well, nice guy. They, they, they ran out, so he took care of it. Move on, and now we get to the meat of Jesus' life. That's what it feels like. That's not at all what happened. What happens in this moment is so significant. And so I'm going to pick it apart, and then I'm going to put it back together. Make sense? So we got to talk about those purification jars. Because that's what got brought up. That's what Jesus brought up. If you'll note, that's what Jesus brought up. Jesus decides, all right, they got a problem, and I am going to use in this problem-solving moment purification jars. In this case, six of them. If you don't know what purification jars were, everyone there would have known what they were. Purification jars, the reason the purification is it was very a part of their way of life, their law, the way they had to do things, is they would regularly have to cleanse and purify themselves before they ate, especially before they would ever go worship. You had to wash your, your hands and your feet, and you would use the water out of the purification jars. Significant. When you begin to try to figure out why in the world does Jesus, first miracle, by the way, if you read your Bible, you'll learn that God highlights over and over and over again what you and I do first is a huge deal to him. It's a significant deal because it, it talks about heart. Whatever you do first, first is not an, an undervalued way of life. First is actually what God calls us to do, a, a way of living with him first. And so these purification jars designed to get you ready, cleansed, to worship God or to do anything in the name of God for God. Fascinating. Now, hold that bit of information, and let's talk about what Jesus says to his mom. My hour has not yet come. Now, when I first read this, especially as a kid, I'm like, oh, what he's saying is, uh, I don't want anyone to know yet who I am. It's what it feels like. It feels like, oh, he's talking about literal time, and he's like, way too early, mom. Like, chill out, mom. Like, no, that's, that's not what he's, he's indicating. 
You'd have to read the rest of the Gospels to actually see multiple places, actually throughout the Bible, where it talks about the time, the time, or the hour of the Messiah. In fact, <clears throat> you could go to the moment Jesus gets arrested, before he gets crucified. And if you were to dig in and say, what did he say? What did he say just before that moment, just before he's betrayed and, and then bound and, and taken? What does he say? He, he actually puts up, now is the time. When Jesus would speak, he would often speak as why he was here and what he was doing. And you and I know the end of the story that was often going to the cross where he was going to die for you and I and actually offer us forgiveness of our sins as the perfect lamb of God, right? We know that. Well, when he would speak of now is not the time, and then he would say now is the time, that's what he's alluding to. He's talking about that moment. Then, to add a little bit more color to this thing, and I promise you some of you are like, where are we going? Just like watch. Okay, Luke 22, all before that, he's with his disciples. And you, you'll probably be familiar with this, but, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup. He, uh, and likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now, most of us know, and let me just clarify if you don't know this, they appear to have some goblet of wine there. And what Jesus is doing is they're used to having wine in this moment, right? That was normal. That was standard. But notice what Jesus does with that in that moment. He actually changes the significance in that moment, right, of the wine. He begins to highlight the wine and say, you know what? You know what this is now going to represent? And he takes it to a whole nother level. So let me try to tie all this together in a way that was... I wish it was explained to me earlier. You've got Jesus showing up as a baby, prophesied about. But then he lives his life, and he begins to do things. And his first miracle, it seems to be like out of the schedule, not routine, not planned, not what he wanted, accidental, and only because his mom put him in this situation. I would disagree. That's, he's still Jesus. And he turns water into wine. He takes something tasteless and bland and, and he turns it into, according to the master of the feast, right? according to the people there going, to the finest wine there. He, he, takes, he takes ordinary and, and, and makes it unordinary. He resolves the family shame in this whole process. Now the family does not have to deal with shame, and they've seen this amazing moment where he simply does, and here's your word, he transforms water into wine. I would believe a better understanding of this first miracle. Why does Jesus do this first miracle? I believe a better understanding than he got roped into a miracle that he didn't want to do and just moved on. It had no significant meaning. I believe it was Jesus going, all right, let's do this. My first miracle, because first things are important are, I'm going to deal with the shame that the devil brings into this world. And so I'm going to show you why I'm here to bring transformation. I don't think it was just like, oh, no, the worst thing is a wedding doesn't have drinks. I think he's using it as a demonstration, which actually, if you were to track the rest of his miracles, they weren't simply just to heal people. Because everyone that he healed, you, you know that they eventually pass away. So you have to look at, like, was there a deeper meaning into these miracles? And in this case, why Jesus chooses the first one to show us his power of transformation, dealing with our shame, has everything to do with your purpose. And the problem is when you and I wrestle with our purpose, why we're here on this earth, we ask the wrong question. We go to God with, God, what do you want me to do? We go with the specifics. I mean, that's what I did. God, where do you want me to live? What do you want me to say here? How do you want me to do this? And we begin to go with like the logistical, give me the, the facts and stuff, even though the Bible often shows us the complete opposite where God goes to a Abraham like, hey, yeah, I just want you to, I want you to, want you to go. Where? I just get to go. Okay. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm simplifying, but I, oftentimes God does not want to divulge all of the details. He wants to get into your life and actually do something. Here's a wiser thing to speak to God if you want to know your purpose and wrestle this out the rest of your life. God, 
make me who you want me to be. This whole series is going to go after why God has you here. And I know most of us are going to be like, sweet. Can't wait for my week that tells me exactly where to live, what job to take, all that kind of, right, right? I caution you, I believe more that God would rather deal with your heart, would rather deal with who you are and shape who you are, because here's the error that I see often, is we crave the details, the circumstance, without letting God deal with our character. And many of us, many of us are in danger of getting into the moment, chasing after the moment, risking for God, not living in faith, and doing the thing, we want to do the thing, and all the while he's like, you aren't ready for that, I need to shape you. I need to do something in your heart. I want to actually work in your soul. But we don't, that's, we're like, yeah, cool, cool. But at least when are we leaving? Like, we want to know the details and and be careful. I think our world actually wants, actually wants, has this craving that God would do something in our lives. Let me show you a stat. I know you're not going to see this on the news. Uh, Barna did some research and asked a bunch of people uh, in the U.S., adults, uh, who would like to grow spiritually? Now, now, I am not naive that when someone answers this question, their version of spirituality could be <clears throat> garbage. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm aware of that. I, I, uh, all religions do not lead to the same place. I, spirituality is not what God has called us to. But I think the question is something you and I ought to look at. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. When, when all these adults are asked, do you want to grow spiritually? Whatever their interpretation is, the vast majority said they want to grow spiritually. They might go about it the wrong way, incorrect way, and not the good way, right? But I think, even though we don't hear it often, that you and I are born with a craving for God, to live for God, and that we're actually, you know another word for growing spiritually? transformation. We want to be transformed. What if you and I were to actually go after this? Rather than say, give me all the details, God. Here, here's, here's your, you don't even have to listen to the rest of the sermon after this. Make your agenda transformation. Many of us have made our agenda. Give me the details, the specs, the timelines, uh, and then I'm going to need resources, and then I'm going to need all of these things. What if we first went, what if our first step with, okay, I want to live my purpose, is, is I want to make my agenda transformation. God, I want you to make me who I need to be so that I will be ready to do what you want me to do. We skip this step, don't we? We think and we assume, well, God will just take care of that. And sometimes he does. Sometimes he forces us into these moments where we're like, I didn't choose that. I think it's wiser and more mature for you and I to say, God, would you do something in my soul? Would you shape me for whatever you've got in store? I love how the the miracle of, of the wine, a verse I didn't read to you, verse 11, John chapter 2, verse 11. Watch what happens to the disciples. They see all this play out. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Just don't answer out loud, but I just do you think that Jesus' intentions was simply to turn water into wine? Or maybe his whole intention was that his disciples would believe in him. Most of us get caught up in the details, don't we? We're like, that's so cool, which it is, that's so cool. But believing in him, having a heart all about him, come on. However you will live the rest of your life, however long, wherever you will live it, whatever you will do, I assure you, God's number one priority with you is your soul, and he wants to shape it. Our mission as a church, I thought I'd show you this if you're brand new. Our mission is to show people who Jesus is. It's a horrible sentence. I've never asked my mom's opinion about this because she's an English teacher. And I don't want, I I know it's not a great sentence, but I think it's a fantastic mission that we pull out of scripture when Jesus, it's a summary of what Jesus said to do. The reason we want you to know who Jesus is, the reason Jesus wants you to know who he is, is because he wants to transform you. It's not just basic so you have the working knowledge and you can join some religion. He wants to do things in your life and through you, I promise you. I'm going to try to look at every one of you. He wants to do great things through you. But you and I are skipping this step of transformation. What's a lesson to learn out of the water and the wine and even other stories here? Everything changes when it's put into the hands of Jesus. 
So my question for you, and just I want you processing just, just privately, like how much of your life, because if you're a normal human being, and, you, and if you're, you and I are the same, in the sense that you and I have a tendency to put a, a lot in his hands, but withhold some things. That, we, that, that we, stuff that maybe we're super emotional about, or, or, or that we crave, or, or, or that we just want all those kinds of things, or, or that make us feel safe, or all that. Kind, we have a tendency to withhold that. What if you and I, the answer, the first step to living life on purpose is, here you go, God. And then tomorrow, here you go, God. And then the days that really hurts, here you go, God. This is not just uh, during the era of Jesus in the, in the New Testament. You go to the Old Testament. Old Testament shows you how people were seeing their relationship with God. Isaiah 64, 8. And yet, oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We all are formed by your hand. You're seeing some indication of how, how people were seeing when they were, when they were engaging God, that, that God existed not just like to be there and, and to reign and all that, that he actually wanted to shape them. And they were like, shape us? Yeah, it's not just one spot. Jeremiah brings it up as well. Oh, Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to this clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. Are you in the hand of God? I think that is a one-time decision and then a daily decision, right? Let me give you an example that I think will help a little bit and maybe help us understand this. I'm going to go to the show, The, the Chosen. Jonathan Rumi, uh, he plays Jesus, which, I mean, casting, they nailed it. Uh, it's... In fact, some of us right now are just having a moment. And you're like, and it's like, it, it's hard to remember. He, but he's, he's an actor, but he portrays Jesus throughout the show. And what I found fascinating was I started getting into his life, at least as, as far as I can get into his life from afar, not knowing him, reading articles. He tells a story, and I'll share it with you. He tells a story that uh, on a Saturday morning in May of 2018, he woke up that Saturday morning pretty distraught upset with God. Maybe you've been there where you felt like, and this was in relation to what God was doing in his life, or actually, frankly, what God wasn't doing in his life. He felt like God wasn't like keeping up with his bargain that Jonathan had made with him. So here's, he wakes up that Saturday morning. He wakes up and then has the thought and remembers he's a hundred dollars overdrawn in his bank account. Those are things that you do wake up to. And you're like, that's just kind of like a thorn in my side. Uh, he has no checks in the mail coming. It's not, he's moved out to California to be an actor. He felt like God told him to go out to be an actor. And, and he was doing what God, he gave up a lot. To, I'm, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And so he just went to be an actor. And, and it wasn't going. No money, no, no food at his home. He's upset with God. And he begins to speak to God. And in this article, he begins to share what he was saying to God. And one of his arguments with God was this. God helps those who help themselves. That was what he, it's what he believed. He, he believed that <clears throat> the way fulfilling our purpose in life is, okay, God, what do you want me to do? I kind of have this idea. Sweet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go do that. Now, now, I don't really need you anymore because thanks for letting me know where to go. I'm going to go do that now, right? And that was his posture was, I'm going to be good. I'm going to love God. I'm going to even read his Bible, and, and I'm going to even talk to him occasionally, but, but not really involve him in everything in my life. I'm just going to, I'm going to go do good things in God's name. And he thought that the transaction with God was, well, if I am doing this because I love you, then you're going to kind of bring the acting jobs. $100 overdrawn, $20 in his pocket, no food, no options. It's amazing what those moments will do to you, right? Either your heart gets soft or your heart gets really, really hard. And the way he says it, I wasn't there. The way he says it, after he got done arguing with God and saying God hasn't shown up, he says, I surrender I surrender. He details more in the article that he had realized that he had done what he thought God wanted him to do, 
But he left God back there because, well, what does God care about acting? And he thought, well, I'm, I mean, I went, I, I'm obeying, so God's just going to go deal with other people. Now why I do what God asked me to do, I don't need to involve God anymore in that. And he had forgotten that there's this surrender. If you don't know this about me, I'll tell you a small detail, and then we're going we're gonna to go after this. Uh, when I first became pastor of this church, I was really excited. I still am. If that, some of you are, yeah. Uh, I'm a fourth generation pastor in a row. One, two, three, four. And when I took the job, I just started doing things the way I knew they should be done. I, God's already told us to move to South Dakota. He's busy now. I'll do what I know to do. That did not work out well um, at all. And this way the story goes, you may have heard it before. It wasn't until I finally had, I was at my wit's end, went home and, and quit to God. I said, God, I'm, I'm done with this. I give up. I'm just going to start doing whatever you say to do. Now, you would think, you didn't start that way, Dave? No? Okay, sorry. I think a lot of us are there, though. Where life has kind of worked us up a bit right now. And we've forgotten, God, I'm going to do what you want to do. And he begins to transform you. Transformation. I want to talk to you. I'm going to, just, I'm going to end with some notes on transformation because I was thinking, okay, okay, this is, this is, this is deep stuff. A water into wine. <clears throat> Jesus indicated, I want to transform your soul. You're like, All right. Like, what do we do about this? Well, oftentimes we screw this up, okay? Transformation. We, we, we kind of get into our own heads about this. And so here's a basic definition or a way to look at transformation. Information plus application. God's spirit does the transforming, but he uses these two pieces uh, all throughout scripture, information plus application. Now, let, let, me, let me help us all understand this by showing you where we break this up and screw this all up. We, we mess it up. We do application, but we minus the information. And that leads to confusion. Jeremiah 17, 9, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Yay. What that verse should help you understand, if you're in the camp right now of just trying to do life God's way without getting into God's word, without actually looking at the information he's provided to understand how he does things, if you're out of the goodness of your heart, because you are a wonderful hearted people, if out of the goodness of your heart you're just trying to do what God leads you to do and ignoring God's word, then you're going to be in danger of living a very confused life because you will show up to the party that you thought God planned and doesn't go the way you thought it would. And we live in an era right now where information is easy to get. We just aren't reading it and applying it and doing anything like that. So you and I got a process. I, I know I know you good hearts and you want to do things for God. Don't skip out on the information. Romans 12.2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. By the way, the behavior and the customs of this world is, what's your heart telling you? Do that. <clears throat> do we need to revisit middle school? Because most of us in middle school went with our hearts. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. <clears throat> Interesting, by changing the way you think. Information has a tendency to do that. Then you will learn. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. A.W. Tozer said it this way. The Christian is strong or weak, depending upon how closely he has cultivated the knowledge of God. Most of us want to know what God wants us to do in our lives. We want to live his purpose and go after that. Let me caution you. Don't try to do what God wants without going into God's word. Here's an example. I'm not going to make you raise your hands, but I bet a lot of hands would go up if, if I said, hey, has anyone ever explained to you the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine, helping you and I understand what Jesus was here for to bring transformation to our souls, right? Most of us are like, no, I never heard that. It shows you a bit of an example, like we've got to get more information that maybe, maybe it's not just going with our heart. And let me show you another breakdown of this math equation. You can think of like math, don't, don't, don't buy that, I don't. Uh, information minus application. Now most of us are like, oh yeah. Leads to indifference, right? Or apathy might be a whole other word. James 1.22 and on. Uh, but don't just listen to God's word. 
You must do what it says. You must do what it says. I'm going to read it again. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. I know we know this as a church. We, I think we, we, we talk a lot about this. Like, make sure that you're loving people. And I know this. Don't just be an information person. Don't just be a person that beats people up with the word of God. Boom, 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 boom. Because then you just misapplied scripture. See what I'm saying? You and I have got to have where we're applying both. It's why it's the era of when we confront people where we often say, uh, I'm going to just tell you the truth. Well, Jesus said grace and truth. You see how we have a tendency to pick one or the other? We pick information or we pick application. If you want transformation, you and I have to pick up both and say, God, would you shape me? And he's so excited to shape you, but he's going to use his word and he's going to use you using his word and it's going to be an amazing thing in your soul. If you want to know the way of God, it's weighty. Let me give you one last statement. I, this has helped me in, in my life. The calling God gives you is always impacted by the surrender you give him. I got too many stories to tell you. We don't have time for them. But I wonder, I wonder if you and I are gathered in this moment, not just to go to church. What if, what if God wants to change a generation? What if God wants his gospel to get out all over the world? What if God has so many other people that he wants to save and he has all intentions of using you? But you and I have got to let our anger get shaped by the word of God. We've got to let our our marriages and our parenting get shaped by God. We've got to make sure that how we're doing life in all the nooks and crannies of life, that we're letting God into all of that. We're surrendering it to God. And when we begin to surrender all of those things to God, he begins to transform us. And guess what you find out in the process of that? You begin to wake up in the morning going, I know what today is about. You begin to live with this purpose that you're like, whoa, this world has a mission and God assigned it for me. Don't skip the transformation process. Yes, the rest of the series, we're going to get into some stuff. It's going to be fun. But I thought we should start with a different kind of a posture. You know what I'm talking about? The surrender posture. That when we bow to the Father and say, "Before before I get into you leading me, I want you to shape me so that I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do. That's the posture of a follower of Jesus Christ, a surrendered soul. So here in a little bit, we're gonna gonna get into taking communion together. I wonder if in this moment when we take communion together, what if our minds are solely focused on how Jesus is the only way for us to be transformed? I think it shapes our purpose. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we believe with all of our hearts, Lord, that you're worth talking to. You are the almighty God, the one who has created all of this. And so, Lord, we, we bow to you. We, we acknowledge you have authority. And so, Lord, would you, we just invite you, Lord, to, to, to get into our souls and, and do the work that is needed. That, to get into our minds and actually begin to shape Uh, what's true and what is good, what is right. And God, would you lead us in such a way that we're we're, we're seeing that life is about you, surrendered to you. Lord, uh, if our hearts need changed, change them. If our hearts need directed, direct them. But I pray in the name of Jesus that you would break all bonds of evil on any one of us and that you would help us be fully devoted followers of yours. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.